Are you sure? <laughs>
Good evening, Salem Bible Church, June 28th. We're going to start out by singing, Jesus is the sweetest name I know. It actually is in the hymn book chorus only. So the verses are going to be up on the wall, okay? Number 76. <clears throat> there have been names that I have loved to hear, but never has there been a name so dear to this heart of mine. As this name divine, the precious, precious name of Jesus. Jesus is the sweetest name I know, and he's just the same as his lovely name. And that's the reason why I love him so. Oh, Jesus is the sweetest name I know. There is no name in earth or heaven above that we should give such honor and such love. As his blessed name, let us all acclaim the wondrous, glorious name of Jesus. Jesus is the sweetest name I know, and he's just the same. As his lovely name, and that's the reason why I love him so. Oh, Jesus is the sweetest name I know. And someday I shall see him face to face, to thank and praise him for his wondrous grace, which he gave to me. When he made me free, the blessed Son of God called Jesus. Jesus is the sweetest name I know, and he's just the same as his lovely name. And that's the reason why I love him so. Oh, Jesus is the sweetest name I know. You know, some of these songs are so wonderful and so precious. Do you ever sing them and think to yourself, someday we get to sing words like this right to him? Jesus, thank you for all the things that you've done to thank and praise him for his wondrous grace, which he gave to me when he made me free, the blessed son of God called Jesus. Great choice today, Mr. Roberts. Let's open up with a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for your son, Jesus. Sometimes we get so busy with the things that are going on in our own lives, so overwhelmed by the things that we see going on in the world around us that we need moments like this where we just stop and think about the sweet, precious name of Jesus. And as we say that word and we think of that name, it can't help but bring to mind all that he did for us the life that he lived on this earth and the way that he lived it, the way that he cared for the people that he came in contact with, the examples that he set for us to follow, and then, of course, that life that he gave, the death on a cross, all of which lead us to say that Jesus is the sweetest name I know. So I thank you that we can have these moments when we reflect on you, where we push out all of the noise that's going on in the world and simply think about you. And so it's a great way to start tonight, Father, to just think of your son Jesus and all that he's done for us and, and for us as a church family. These words ring true. We believe that it is the sweetest name we know. And so we thank you tonight, Lord. We thank you. Amen. Let's turn to number 224. We have come into his house. We have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship him. We have come into his house 
and gathered in his name to worship him. We have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship Christ the Lord. Worship him, Christ the Lord. Let's forget about ourselves and magnify his name and worship him. Let's forget about ourselves and magnify his name and worship him. Let's forget about ourselves and magnify his name and worship Christ the Lord. Worship him, Christ the Lord. Number 83. There's something about that name. Mm. singing and that and one of them was they're so glad I do not lead the song singing like this <laughs> <laughs> get the nostril look <laughs> Charlie Brown <laughs> did you catch that part of the song uh, that says and I was thinking about this the other night so uh, if you were I happen to be a late night owl so if you were around Friday night after about 11 o'clock between 11 and about 1 in the morning, it was rocking outside. Um, and so we have a little problem down in the church basement where the water floods in through the downstairs. So we have this makeshift way of trying to keep the water out. So whenever I start hearing it rain, I run down there to try to get it set up. And so just before it started pouring, I had the back door open and that, that fragrance after the rain, you can almost smell the fragrance freshness of it. Of course, pretty soon after that, it was thunder, lightning, and wind, but there was that, that moment where that, that part of that song, aren't there things that we sing that you stop for a minute and go, yeah, that's right. There's that moment where everything seems fresh and right, and whenever we think about things that are fresh and right, how can we not think about the name of Jesus? And so... Uh, these songs sometimes really speak to us. Okay, what's going on? Obviously, uh, uh, we've been telling you this Tuesday at Lapham Cemetery, which is really right up Salem Road here, dead end at Brookville, and go to the left. At 11 o'clock on Tuesday, we're going to have just a small, short graveside service for Rachel. Uh, Rachel Alexander was a part of this church for many years. She passed away in the midst of the COVID crisis, and we didn't even have any kind of a funeral service because Everyone in the family is gone except the grandkids, and one's in Florida, and one's in Grand Rapids, and so this is their first opportunity to come back. 
And so we're going to have a little service at the Graveside Church family. And anybody that knew the Alexanders are welcome to meet there. Uh, just park on the outside and find your way, and you'll find us standing there somewhere uh, 11 o'clock on Tuesday. Wednesday night's live stream. Uh, opportunity for us to just look into the book of Psalm, Psalms and uh, share prayer requests. So don't be afraid to send them into to us. Uh, make sure that we're aware of things that you need us to pray for, and we'll take care of that. And each week we try to spend some time in the Word and then some, some time talking about good news things. This week we're going to also talk about there are some things going on in the world that you need to be aware of and be careful of because they are, I think, Satan's subtle attempt We're going to talk about Satan tonight. But I propose that Satan's overall goal is to get to the place where we can't say anything about the sweetest name that we know. He'd love it if there was some kind of rule that we couldn't talk about Jesus or talk about the fact that he's the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by him. So there's a lot of stuff going on in the world that don't doubt that he's not behind it. So we'll talk about that a little bit on Wednesday night. So Join us for that. I know some of you are doing a thing called a watch party, which is nice, encouraging people to follow along. And so we'll continue to do that throughout the summer, Wednesday nights, uh, just live stream only. So that's what's going on here. Uh, any updates? I didn't talk to Tracy today, so I don't know anybody hear anything from her. Uh, how's mom? Mom, she's okay. She's just bruised a little bit. Okay. Is she back home now? She's back home. Okay. Good. Okay. But we'll be bruised and sore, I am sure. Okay. All right. Anything else to pray about? Let's, let's pray for Tracy, pray for Kurt's mom. Anything else that's on our list of things we don't want to overlook? Obviously, too, for us, our, our goal is to have a Vacation Bible School. And our goal is to have the Corn Fest. Uh, we kind of had our first test run yesterday because we had a dinner here at the church and tried to figure out how to serve food rather than let people serve themselves. And I thought that went well. I think that'll kind of probably what it'll look like at, at Cornfest as far as like controlling everything. So uh, that's our goal. Uh, it was interesting though, uh, the Lord family was here this morning. I liked what he had to say about that idea of the, the cloud by day and the fire by night. And this reminder that Sometimes God would let them stay for a couple days, sometimes a year, sometimes just a day, and they had to move, and they were totally dependent on where God sent them. Isn't that what's going on here in the year 2020? Uh, we are totally dependent on what happens in the world. We can have vacation Bible school. I'd like to. I don't know. Uh, are we going to have Corn Fest? Like to. I don't know. Everything is kind of an adventure, so we're kind of waiting to see where the cloud goes and see what happens. So that's not mom, is it? Well, we may have to pray again. <laughs> so let's pray and be thankful now, and hopefully she's okay. But let's just take a moment and pray for that. Lord, our missionary this morning mentioned and reminded us about how the nation of Israel were, was totally dependent on your direction. Sometimes they stayed at a place for weeks, a year, sometimes just a day. They learned to just trust in your direction. For so long, we've kind of been coasting along almost on autopilot, and now we hit the year 2020, and everything is just thrown up in the air. And we're not sure what's going to happen. We'd like to have Vacation Bible School. We'd like to have Corn Fest, but we're just going to wait and see which way the cloud takes us. We're going to trust in you, and we're going to continue to do the mission that you gave us, which is to tell the world about Jesus in whatever creative ways we have to do it. So just pray that you continue to guide us and direct us. And as we've been praying, Lord, continue to protect us from this virus. And then, Father, of course, we've been praying for our elderly. Thank you that Kurt's mom didn't break anything. Thank you that she's back home. Pray that this phone call means everything's okay. But, Lord, so many times we are reminded that there are things beyond our control. We can't watch over the elderly every moment, but you can. I'm so thankful for that. So we just pray that you watch over all of our loved ones who are growing in age. We think of the ones that are still in, in uh, long-term care facilities. You know, Carolyn Bjorkman hasn't been able to see her grandkids, her children for months. And, uh, and the governor just continued their lockdown. And so we pray, Father, that you'll support those, Heidi's mom, those that 
I haven't been able to have real contact with people. And so watch over them, protect them from this COVID in the same way that you're protecting us. Thank you, Lord, that Tracy seems to be getting better and stronger. Once again, we ask that you'll help the doctors find out exactly what it was that caused these seizures uh, so that they can get her on the right medicine and a treater for that. Thank you that we live in this marvelous day and age where we've got CAT scans and we've got medicine that can treat most things. And so, Father, we just pray and uh, leave these folks in your care. We realize that this uh, virus is still out there, and so we just pray that you'll continue to protect us this summer. We leave ourselves in your hands, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Mom, okay? Okay. <laughs> All right. Tell her we are worth. Number 312, Calvary covers it all.
sang the world in praise, but when he saved my soul, cleansed and made me whole, it took a miracle of love and grace. Though here his glory has been shown, we still can't fully see. Hope everybody had a great afternoon, sun shining, looking good outside. All right, we're turning ourselves back to the book of Luke. Uh, we left ourselves off last week. It was Father's Day, and we were talking about what's the greatest goal for fathers? How about become prayer warriors? How much our families need that today? Moms and dads who are committed to the cause of Jesus Christ. And so we spent really the whole day, both morning and evening, talking about the subject of prayer and how we can kind of up our prayer game. And one of the things that we talked about, and it's so important that the Bible gives us two different stories about the importance of being persistent. We forget that. This last week, I was reminded... I saw an illustration of persistence. So if you know me, I love to hike. I love being out in the woods. And so I've discovered a new place right next to the Bagley's. I like going over there because uh, not many people have discovered it yet. You go to Mayberry, especially since the lockdown, and Mayberry is just packed with people. Next to the Bagley's, not so much. Now that's the upside. The downside, the bugs think it's their place. So I started walking, and I'm well prepared. I've got, my, uh, I've got my chemical, and I know it's bad for me, DEET. It's going to take a year or two off my life, but I am covered in head to toe in DEET. And I got my hat covered in, in uh, some good deep woods off. And I barely get out of the car, and I start down the trail. And you've ever had one of those horse flies that decides it's hungry? And, and it wants my head, but I got the chemical on. So he keeps coming to me, like banging off my hat, because he gets there, and whoa, whoa. So I figure, well, okay, you know, I, I'm, I had in my mind a three-mile hike, so I figure, you know, 50, 60 feet of this banging into the hat, and this guy's going to say, enough's enough. Well, I have a watch, and the watch tells me, you know, you reach a half mile, you reach a mile. I get to the half mile mark, this dude is still buzzing my hat. And I had just preached this sermon, and I'm thinking, 
Nature understands persistence. I hit the mile mark, still buzzing my head. Now, of course, I don't know, because I wasn't stopping to identify. He might have tagged off to somebody else. But that fly kept buzzing. And the way this trail is, it kind of, it's, it's a loop. So you kind of start out one way, you go to the end, and, and you just kind of come back around. The whole three-mile loop, this horse fly was buzzing me. Why? Because taking a piece of me was important to him. My friends, we make the mistake of not being as persistent as the horse fly. We think we just throw something out and it's going to be taken care of, and yet the scripture gave us these two stories right to the persistent widow to say, if it's important to you, let the Heavenly Father know about it. What does that mean for us now? We should be praying persistently for more opportunities than ever before. With all the things that are going on in the world, there are more people watching online than ever before. I think people are hungry for answers. And where are the true answers found in this book? So we should be persistent in asking God for opportunities. What are we going to do about Vacation Bible School? What are we going to do about Cornfest? I don't know, but the Father does. So let's be persistent in asking him every day for blessing. Don't you like the sound of God blessing Salem Bible Church? If the horsefly knows, don't give up. We should do the same thing. Now, if you want that illustrated, I encourage you, park in the Bagley driveway. That horsefly will be waiting for you. And don't put any deep woods off on. And then when he gets you, you'll, for the next week, you'll be thinking, persistence. I like to kind of kid about it, but I do think we've made a mistake in our generation because we're so used to getting things right away that we have overlooked the fact that God said, keep pounding the throne room door with your requests. I think it's just a way that tells him that this is important. And so let's make sure when we up our prayer game and we become more in line with being a prayer warrior, persistent, persistence is key, making sure that we never give up. And then the last thing that we looked at is Jesus talked about the fact that his father is a giver of good gifts. So ask God for things, for blessings, for Maybe there's things going on in your family. Bring it into his presence and say, Lord, we need help. Pray to the Father who is a good gift giver. Tonight, there's an incident that happens. Jesus once again encounters a demon-possessed person. But this time, the response of the crowd is different. They almost accuse Jesus of being able to remove these demons because he's working for Satan. So we're going to dive into that a little bit, and as long as we're there, we're going to spend some time talking about demons. What can they do? What can't they do? And I think that'll help us understand some of the things that are going on in the world around us, and then eventually we'll start asking the question, can Christians be demon-possessed? We'll talk about that. And then should we get into the exorcism business? I mean, we're always looking for ways to make money. We'll find out. Stay tuned, and we're going to know whether or not we should or shouldn't. You might be surprised, Roberts. Let's open up with a word of prayer. Some good stuff tonight about demons, things that we all need to know. Lord, thank you for these reminders about the importance of becoming prayer warriors. And this idea of being persistent. We live in a day and age where we do want things right away. Uh, it's kind of become a part of our DNA. We turn on the air conditioner in the car and we get mad when it takes more than 30 seconds to cool us off. We put food in the microwave and are irritated if it says five to seven minutes. And yet the scripture makes it very clear that regular, consistent, persistent prayer, the bringing of our request is something that gets the Father's attention. So we thank you for that reminder and that we pray that you might help us to be more persistent in the things that we're bringing into your presence. 
Lord, we want Salem Bible Church to be used in a mighty way. We believe that the message that we have is what, what the world needs. It needs the message of Jesus Christ. So we just pray that you'll bless our efforts, whether it's through the online ministry or in person. But Lord, we want to make a difference for you. And that's something we're going to be praying and asking about all summer. So Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now remember, when you're praying for all these persistent things too, remember when it comes to Corn Fest that there is no dream crew. So that's a million possible people. I'm sure we could, we could handle that, right, Deb? Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's go. Here we go. Luke chapter 11. We'll start reading in verse 14, and we'll just read through verse 20. We'll get some more of it, but at least this will set the stage for the conflict, and then we'll look at uh, I just picked out five things from the scriptures that we should know about demons just as a part of our regular life. Uh, it'll help us if we ever have any encounters with him. But let's start reading in verse 14. So it says, Jesus was driving out a demon that was mute. When the demon left the man, the man who had been mute spoke. And the crowd was amazed. But some of them said, by Beelzebub, the prince of demon, he's driving out demons. Others tested him by asking for a sign from heaven. Do you ever get amazed at this crowd? He's doing miracle after miracle, and they're still skeptical. They're still wondering what, what's going on. It's, it's, it's amazing. Verse 17, Jesus knew their thoughts and answers them by saying, Listen, any kingdom divided itself will be ruined. Hmm. Wonder if the United States could learn anything from that statement right there. And a house divided itself against itself will fall. If Satan is divided against himself, how can his kingdom stand? I say this because you claim that I drive out demons by Beelzebub. Now, if I drive out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your followers drive them out? So then they will be your judges. But if I drive out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come to you. Wow. So here's this reminder that, especially during this time that Jesus was on the earth, that this demonic activity seemed to be very visible. Uh, Jesus ran into a number of individuals that were possessed by demons. Now let me ask you, uh, do you think Satan is still that busy today? I think he is, but I think he's gotten better at it. What do you think I mean by that? Hmm? More subtle. He's not flipping and flopping people around like he was here. He's gotten trickier at it because he doesn't want people going, uh oh, that's what's going on, because he uses these influences to change what's going on in the world. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right, let's go into this. Let's find out some things that we should uh, consider. Let's go first to the book of First Peter. First thing that I want us to point out, and I think this one is important. Let me get there myself, though. First Peter chapter 5. The first thing that we have to recognize when it comes to this to this discussion about demons is that demons are real. Oftentimes we see our society kind of paint them as cartoon characters. I put one up there for you. The devil himself is often described like that, like a cartoon character. I think that's another way that Satan does it. Oh, it's just a cute little cartoon character and, and you know, there's nothing really to be worried about. Satan is real. His followers are real. And as we are going to find as we go along, they have power in this day and age, and they should not be taken lightly. Matter of fact, in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8 is a verse that we've looked at many times, but I think we need to reread it in light of this. Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion 
looking for someone to devour, resist him. Stand firm in the faith because you know that your brothers throughout the world are are undergoing the same kind of suffering. So here's this reminder. Don't just sit back and think they're cute little cartoon characters. Be aware of the fact that Satan is doing whatever he can. He hates the message that we preach. And he does everything he can to kind of water down that message. I've been warning you for a long time that one of the things that I think Satan is trying to do, in our country, we have this wonderful thing called free speech. It's in the First Amendment. But as time has gone on, you have noticed that there's some limits to the free speech. And one of the limits to free speech these days is hate speech. You can't say anything that's hateful. I think the long-term goal that Satan has in mind is that if we get to the point, and it's not us, Jesus is the one that said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. That's pretty exclusive. Because when you say that, it means every other religion and every other path that leads to God is wrong. Because it's not through Jesus Christ, it's not the only way. And I think that Satan is trying to work it that anytime we would say something that is hurtful to other religions, that we can't say it. So don't take your First Amendment rights lightly. Be thankful that we live in this country where we can say Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by him. So Satan is working behind the scenes all the time. And so Peter's saying, don't be foolish. Be aware of what's going on in the world. And be aware that Satan is in the business of trying to stop what it is that we are doing. All right, let's go to Matthew chapter 9. This next one is pretty simple because it is illustrated often in the Gospels. But clearly, demons could indwell individuals. Matthew chapter 9, verses 32 and 33. While they were going out, A man who was demon-possessed and could not talk was brought to Jesus. And when the demon had been driven out, the man who had been mute spoke. The crowd said, in amazement, nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. The same kind of look at it from Matthew as we just saw in Luke. But let's go to Matthew chapter 17. Verses 14 through 18. When they came to the crowd, a man approached Jesus and knelt before him. Lord, have mercy on my son. He has seizures and is suffering greatly, often falls into the fire or the water. I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. Oh, unbelieving Perverse generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy here. Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of the boy, and he was healed at that moment. So here we have these reminders that these demons that exist in the world today can literally come and take up residence in people. And, And you guys know in the scriptures, sometimes more than one demon could reside in somebody. Remember, the, the main story, the, the most humorous story, is when the, they were in the guy and they said their name was Legion and they came out and they went into the whole herd of pigs and went down into the lake and drowned. So there's this idea that they're able to possess and, as you see in here, they're able to control the person. What they say, their actions, and the things that they do, they absolutely have power. Let's go to Mark chapter 9 for the third thing that you need to be reminded of about demons. The third thing we have to know is that demons have the power to harm people. Here's the same look at that story that we just looked at. But let's read it now from the book of Mark chapter 9 and verse 22. Saying again about this, how long has the boy been like this? The father said, since childhood, it has often thrown him into fire or water to 
kill him. Wow. Power that these demons possess in this world. Probably the greatest example of the, the limits or the limitless, limitlessness. Is that a word? Okay. Close. Job chapter 1. Let's turn there. Limit, lit. Yeah, forget about it. Unlimited. You guys ever done that? Just between us now. You ever start to type something in a, in a letter that you're sending out and your spelling is so bad that the computer can't even figure it out? Just between us, let's admit it. I have gotten very creative at coming up with a different word. <laughs> like this, I can't really say limitless, so unlimited. See how that works? Yeah, that's right. You guys don't want to admit, you don't want to be open like me. All right, let's go to the book of Job, chapter 1. This is an interesting story that allows us to see a little bit of the power that Satan and his followers possess. Sometimes we forget that when Satan fell, he was named the God of this world. And he has power in this world. And in Job chapter 1, we get a little bit of an insight of the things that he can control, the things that he can do. If you're not familiar with the story, let's begin reading at verse 6 and we'll kind of set the stage. I don't know why this happened. Because I, listen, you're probably like me. If I am the King of kings and the Lord of lords, God of all heaven and earth, the minute Satan rebelled and fell, guess where I would have put him? Lake of fire. Let's be done with this. But he didn't. And he left him on this earth, and we have all of this. I don't know why. I don't know why in verse 6 there's this conversation that goes on between God and Satan. But it does. So let's read it. So one day, the angels are coming back and forth. They're presenting themselves before the Lord. My guess is what happens is the angels go out. They have tasks that God gives them, whether it's to protect us or give us answers or guide us. And then they come back, and the Father sends them back out. But some, at some point in time, Satan tags along and wants to get into conversation with the king. And the Lord says to him, where did you come from? And he answered, well, from roaming the earth and going back and forth in it. So the Lord decides to kind of extend the conversation and says, well, what do you think about my friend Job here? There is no one on earth like him. He's blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Satan replies, well, does he fear him for nothing? You put a hedge around him in his household and everything he has. That's why you'll often hear us pray a hedge of protection. This is where we get it from. You've blessed the work of his hand so that his flocks and herds are spread. But I'll tell you what, God, if you stretched your hand out against him and struck him, struck everything he had, he'd, he'd curse you to your face. So the Lord says to Satan, okay, okay, I'm going to give you some room here. Everything is in your hands, but on the man himself, Job, you can't touch him. So Satan goes out from the presence of the Lord. Now this is where it gets interesting. This is where you see that Satan has power. So Job's sons and daughters, they're feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house. A messenger comes and says, listen, the oxen and the donkeys were grazing nearby, but the neighbors, the Sabians, attacked and carried them off, and they put the servants to the sword. I'm the only one who escaped. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, the fire of God, of course we know it's not the fire of God, it's the fire of Satan, came from the sky and burned up the sheep and the servants, and I'm the only one to escape. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, the Chaldeans formed three raiding parties. They swept down, took your camels, carried them off. They put your servants to the sword, and I'm the only one who escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came. Your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at your oldest brother's house when suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house. It collapsed on them, and they are dead. And I'm the only one that escaped to tell you. At this, Job gets up, tears his robe, shaves his head, and falls to the ground in worship. That was the way that they showed that their 
you know, the, their brokenness. Wow. My friend, Satan is able to have fire come down from heaven. He's able to produce such a mighty wind that the roof and the thing comes out and he literally could take the life of another human being. Have you thought about that for a minute, about how powerful our enemy is? Maybe just studying this will help you be a little bit more persistent in praying that that hedge gets heavier and heavier around you. I'm often reminded of that. When I was a kid growing up, I lived in the city, so we didn't spend much time going to the woods. We didn't have any state, state parks by us. If you were really wild, you went to the forest preserve. <laughs> Little blocks of you know, woods that they sent out. But in the neighborhood that I lived in, my neighbors loved hedges. They were all over the place. You ride your bike down the road, and there were just you know, just hedges everywhere. I guess they were cheaper than fences. <clears throat> and I had a neighbor on the corner that I liked to hang out with, and their dad had trimmed the hedges, but had trimmed a little part in the middle that we could hide in. And each year, those hedges got bigger and thicker, and it just felt when you were in there like you were protected from the entire world. And every time I read this about the hedge of protection, I can still close my eyes and remember those hedges and how much fun it was as a kid and how thick they seemed. My friends, don't forget to be praying about those kind of hedges. And so, obviously, Satan has power. Let's keep reading. Because in chapter 2, it says, again, the angels are coming and presenting themselves before the Lord, and Satan pops back in again and says the same thing. The Lord once again brags on Job that he's still upright, he's still fearing God still maintains his integrity, even though you tried to incite him against me. Satan replies, well, sure. Skin for skin, he said, a man will give you all he has for his own life, but if you stretch out your hand and strike his flesh and bones, he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, very well. He is in your hands, but you must spare his life. So Satan goes out from the presence of the Lord and infected Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the top of his head, so bad that Job took a piece of broken pottery and scraped himself with it as he sat among the ashes. And then, of course, if that wasn't bad enough, then his wife said, why don't you just curse God and die? That's just We could talk about that for a long time, but what a healthy relationship that is, but I think we'll leave that alone today. So he can control the weather, he can create fire that comes from the sky. He clearly was able to take life. And he also had the ability to inflict physical harm on us. So this enemy that we're talking about has real power. That brings us to the next one. And for this one, let's go to the book of Jude all the way back. Because this one is really important. Because this... Well, it kind of pops up occasionally in every 10, 20, 30 years. Sometimes it'll pop up in a movie. But here's number four. Now that we've seen the power that they have, here's the next thing that I want to teach you. Do not, under any circumstances, try to fight them on your own. You'll see this often. <clears throat> there are literally people. I picked some of these pictures out off the Internet uh, there are actually Catholic priests that are assigned the job of being exorcist. The guy on the right, uh, his name is Bob Larson. He's written a number of these demonic books, and he is in this picture trying to cast demons out of someone. When I was living and working as a police officer in the Chicago area, I was also a youth pastor at a church, and I was in the town of Berwyn, and we were right next to a town called Oak Park. And there was another youth pastor in that town at the Baptist church there. His name was Mark Brubeck. And he really got into this whole demonic thing. He ended up writing a couple books about it. And it was all a buzz in the area because every week he was doing these uh, demonic um, exorcisms. And so I'd heard about it and I, I got to see what's going on. And so I went there on a couple Wednesdays and I'll tell you something. 
I don't know what was going on, but it was pretty scary. So it starts out in a regular meeting, and all of a sudden he's sensing that there are people that are demon-possessed, and all of a sudden people are flopping out of their chairs, and they're looking like they're having a, you know, some kind of a seizure, and they're, they're, they're crying out, and they're trying to cast these demons out, and I'm sitting there going, get me out of here. Now why? My friends, I just showed you that Satan and his forces have real power. You want to know where our power comes from? The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I take you, I'm going to take you to the book of Jude because I want to let you know it's not like we're, we're backing away from Satan. There's this reminder in the scriptures that even the forces of God realized that there were moments in time where they weren't going to take on the forces of Satan. Let's look here. In Jude chapter 1, in verse 9. Here's just a little glimpse of a moment in time that happened, and we actually get a picture of one of the angels that we know. We only know a couple by name, Gabriel and Michael. So here's Michael, who's called an archangel. So apparently when it comes to the angelic forces, they have rank. We see it in Satan's forces, too, because there's a moment in the Old Testament where we get insight into one that's called the Prince of Persia. And Michael here is called an archangel, and it says, When he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not dare to bring a slanderous accusation against him, but said, The Lord rebuke you. So even Michael, the archangel, backed off and said, I'm not taking this on my own. I'm telling you, I'm here in the power and the presence of the Lord himself. The reason that we have to be careful is because Satan is a very busy, powerful person. There's a verse that I left off when we were in the book of Luke. Let's turn back there. Luke chapter 11, because the passage tells us something about those that want to get into the exorcism business. You better be good at what you're doing. Because Jesus mentioned something that could happen. So let's keep reading. This is Luke chapter 11. So Jesus is talking about this fact that he, you know, cast these demons out. But the demons, these particular demons, they like residing in someone. So Jesus continues to talk about the story, kind of almost putting out a little bit of a warning. So say you're in the exorcism business, you better be good at what you're doing. Because let's say you were able to cast out a demon. This passage tells you what might happen after you do that. Let's keep reading. It says, Verse 24, when an evil spirit comes out of a man, it goes through arid places seeking rest and doesn't find it. Then it says, I will return to the house I left. It, revi- it, re- it, re- I'm sorry. it arrives and it finds its house swept and clean in order and then goes in and takes with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself and go in and live there. And the final condition of that man is worse than the first. So this idea of being in the exorcist business, and I just picked out two books. I literally just went on Google and put on, you know, books about casting out demons, and these two popped up. Um, We need to be very careful. You want to know the best way to help a person who is struggling with demon influence or struggling with demon possession? You tell them the story of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the one that can come in and cleanse the house. It doesn't mean that I don't think that we should not be involved in this. If you see, listen, all of us at one time or another have maybe ran into somebody that you think to yourself, there's something more going on there. There's some demonic influence that's happening. Wouldn't that be a great moment for you to become a persistent prayer warrior for that person? Look for opportunities to be able to talk to them about that. But I, that's my personal thing. 
I don't think that we are to be in the exorcism business. Now, if I just left you at that place, you'd be, boy, this is pretty depressing there, preacher. They're powerful. They can possess people. They can control the weather. And they can inflict physical harm. Gee, thanks. I'm not going to leave you there, though, because the scripture doesn't leave us there. Because there is this encouraging reminder when it comes to any kind of demonic activity that demons have no power in the presence of Jesus. None. Let's look at a couple examples that remind us of that. Let's go to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. Let's back up a little. Yeah, let's go right to verse 21. So they come out of Capernaum. When the Sabbath came, Jesus went to the synagogue to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Just then a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an evil spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, O Holy One of God. Be quiet, Jesus said sternly. Come out of him. The evil man shook violently and it came out of him with a shriek. Did you see how much power those demons had in the presence of Jesus? How much power? None. They couldn't argue. They couldn't reply. They had to obey immediately the very word that was spoken by the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. My friends, that's where our protection comes from. If you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you are a child of the King. Jesus, His Spirit, comes and takes up residence in us. That's our defense shield. They have no power in his presence, and that is not the only place that we see this. Let's go to the book of James. James chapter 2. James chapter 2 and verse 19 says this. You believe there is one God that's good. Even the demons believe that and what? Tremble, shudder in the presence of the king. So they have all this power. And if you just read about it, it would almost cause you to be nervous about, well, how can I face them in this world? And then you see these references where they can't even speak in his presence. They must do exactly as God tells them to do. And here's this reminder that the very thought of Jesus and who he is and what he's done, you almost see them trembling. My friends, there the day is coming when these very same powerful demons are going to bow their knee before the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's what brings us hope and peace when you look and see the power that they have is the fact that they shudder and tremble in his presence. Let's move ahead to just chapter 4 and verse 7 of the book of James. Submit yourselves then, submit yourself then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, your sinners, purify your hearts, you double minded, grieve, mourn, and wail, change your laughter to mourning, your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. So here are these reminders that though it seems they seem powerful in this world, my friends, they have no power when it comes to the King of Kings. And the good news is we are servants of his. 
So don't be discouraged. Now the question that comes up is, well, pastor, what about, what about believers? Can they be demon-possessed? Well, the good news is I got the answers for you, but I'm out of time. And Pastor Chip Chase is coming in next week, so here's the next slide. We'll talk a little bit about that next week. Well, actually, two weeks. So turn back in. Two Sundays from now, Sunday morning and Sunday night, we'll let you know whether or not you could be demon-possessed. But in the interim, let me leave you with this. Those of you that know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you were just reminded that if you resist the devil, he will flee from you. As powerful as they seem, they have no power in the presence of the king. Rejoice in that today. Father, thank you so much for this reminder that Satan and his followers are real. They clearly have power in this world. Satan had the power to literally take a life, had the power to inflict personal harm. And yet, Lord, you could read those things and almost be afraid until you read those passages where the demons could not move in your presence. They had to obey the exact thing that you said. So Christians, if you're watching and listening to this today, don't be afraid. You serve the king. And demons have no power in his presence. Praise God for that today. Thank you, Lord, that every time we look into the book, even though the story we start may seem like it's going to have a bad ending, there's always a happy ending for those that are followers of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Thank you for that, Lord. Bless and encourage us with that truth. Watch over us this week, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Next Sunday, Pastor Chip Chase will be here. See you Wednesday night as we spend some time praying together.